Always. We ask the question. What is the question world? Bio je ambasador Francuske u Washingtonu i u Vijeću sigurnosti Ujedinjenih nacija. Smatra se vodećim francuskim stručnjakom za međunarodne odnose, a trenutno je ugledi član i analitičar Atlantskog vijeća u Washingtonu. O odnosima Emanuela Macrona i Vladimira Putina, transatlantskim vezama i budućnosti NATO saveza za Al Jazeera govori ambasador Gerard Aro. Now, Ambassador Gerard, hello and welcome to Al Jazeera and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. Now, while most of the world is shunning Russia's President Vladimir Putin over uh, his invasion of Ukraine, one of the few leaders, few European leaders, uh, who is keeping an, uh, an open line of communication with him uh, is French President Emmanuel Macron. Uh, does Macron's stance reflect France's uh, post-World War II tradition of trying to carve out its own geopolitical path uh, and its refusal to blindly follow um, the United States and NATO in all spheres. You know, it's, I think what the President Emmanuel Macron, the French president, is doing, it's common sense. Whatever you think of what President Putin has done, and it's an aggression, and the behavior, of course, of the Russian forces in Ukraine is, is awful. But at the end of the day, uh, if there is a peace, it will be a peace negotiated between Ukraine and Russia, and Russia is President Putin. So it's totally normal that President Macron is keeping open a channel with President Putin to try to help to reach disagreement between Ukraine and Russia. You know, there are a lot of countries who are ready to die to the last Ukrainians. And, and it's not the case of France. We know that war is an abomination. Uh, Ukraine is destroyed. Uh, Ukrainians are killed, and we, we need to reach a peace agreement as soon as possible with uh, Russia. Right, but has France also extended its support to President Zelensky? Yes. You know, every phone call by uh, President Macron with President uh, Putin, you know, there is a phone call before and after between Macron and Zelensky. I think you have noticed that President Zelensky himself wants to negotiate with Russia. President right. Zelensky is not only an, a, a great leader, you know, to defend his country, he knows that his country is destroyed by this war and he wants peace also. So, he, so far, he has always considered that what President Macron was doing was helpful. Right. Uh, when you look at the Western media coverage of the war in Ukraine, um, has it been highly charged, morally self-righteous uh, righteous and plainly political? You know, uh, we are living in a world of uh, social media. We are living in a world where images are traveling immediately. Uh, so, so that's the problem. You know, it's very difficult to have uh, a sort of political approach of the war, because at the end of the day, the war will, will be solved on political basis. You know, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Poland has told Macron, you know, you don't negotiate with Hitler, you know, which is stupid. You know, Putin, whatever he's doing, is not Hitler. And if you say that to any uh, really aggressor, you never have, uh, you never have peace. Uh, so, so that's the, 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 the need and the difficulty for the political leaders who keep their, their head cool, it's difficult to go against these, these passions and these emotions. Right. Um, the war in Ukraine remains of white, vital concern uh, to all of Europe, and its outcome is far from clear. Um, the risk uh, of further escalation is not mitigated. Um, but whatever its outcome is, do you believe that it has already proven to be a watershed moment for Europe's security architecture? I, I don't know as for the architecture, but it's a watershed moment for Europe because in a sense, you know, we the Europeans, we have been living since 1945 uh, with the exception of a war you know pretty well, the civil war in Yugoslavia uh, uh, in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s. But we have, lived, we have lived in a world without a war between states uh, and since 1945. And I think that a lot of Europeans were dreaming or thinking that that was the natural situation. And suddenly war is back. You know, the war, the way we were waging in the 19th century, a country invading a country. And it's quite a trauma, quite a shock for the Europeans. So I think 
there will be a before and after uh, Ukrainian, uh, Ukrainian war. The first consequence uh, is not about European uh, security architecture, it's about NATO. You know, President Macron was saying that NATO was brain dead before right. the war. Uh, because really, basically, NATO appeared as an alliance without an enemy, and suddenly there is an enemy. So NATO is back. And not only NATO is back, but, you know, uh, uh, yesterday, I think, uh, Sweden and Finland, who never joined NATO even during the Cold War, have said that they are ready to consider uh, NATO membership. So there will be consequences. I think it's too early to, to guess what consequences it will be. But... At any case, one of them will be the revival of NATO. So you, you're saying is that uh, what you're saying is that President Putin has inadvertently uh, reinvigorated NATO as an alliance. Oh, you know the, the the inadvertent to quote you inadvertent consequences of Putin decision are, are, are a lot. I think it's the most counterproductive uh, uh, decision he has ever taken by invading Ukraine. Because first, uh, NATO is back, but also the Americans are back because the Americans were tiptoeing out of Europe to shift to Asia to face uh, to face China. It's only the, the military budget of the Western European countries. You know, most of the countries are announcing, and especially Germany, are announcing that they are going to increase their military budget. And we can bet also that he is creating against Russia an Ukrainian nation. Mm -hmm. Now, um, uh, France has been criticized in the past for not uh, sufficiently consulting its allies vis-à-vis uh, -vis, uh, Russia. Has this changed since the invasion of Ukraine? Has President Macron put more effort into uh, uh, coordinating with other, with other uh, NATO and EU member states? You know, uh, for during the 40 years of my diplomatic career, I have heard many times on many topics that France has not consulted the other members. So I don't know, you know, really, on one side, I think it's the national genius of the French. Uh, you know, uh, we love to, to go to the stage uh, by ourselves. Uh, and on the other side, it's also the other countries, you know, really try to control what France is doing, which is totally normal. So I suppose that in the coming 40 years, there will be again, you know, many criticisms of the fact that the French want to, be, to remain independent. Right, but we do remember France for many, many years stayed out, or pulled out of NATO, and then only returned back in the late uh, 80s, as far as I rem remember. Uh, how would you explain France's relationship towards NATO today? Well, first, we didn't leave NATO. We left the military structure of NATO. Right. Uh, we, we remained in the alliance, which was important. We were ready to fulfill all of our obligations in the, in the framework of the, uh, of the alliance. No, there is really, I think, for the last 20 years, and very often, actually, I was in charge of it on the French side, uh, we are convinced that the, the Europeans should be able to take their own defense uh, in their own hands. Uh, really, uh, because, you know, even if the Americans are back because of Ukraine, if you look at all the conflicts around Europe, uh, Syria, for instance, but also Libya, or also uh, North Africa, you see that the Americans don't care. And, and I think it's normal because uh, really essential American interests are not at stake. And what the French have been saying is, okay, let's keep NATO, but we should be able, we the Europeans, to act on our own when the, our own interests are at stake. And that's right. what we have been repeating I don't think we have a lot of success. Right. Uh, uh, President Macron has been, or as you said, over the past year, spearheading the, the, his strategic autonomy vision. Uh, has the war in Ukraine um, given his drive for EU autonomy new impetus, or has it crashed and burned in Ukraine? No, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to uh, French initiative has crashed down in Ukraine, but I think, as I have said, uh, really, uh, what we are going to see, at least in the coming months and years, is a revival of NATO. Uh, there will be a strong feeling among the allies that there is a Russian threat and that we need the American guarantee uh, and that, uh, that we need the American presence in Europe. So I, I would guess that, unfortunately, uh, the French calls for European defense, which were already not, not heard, by our American partner, by our European partners, will be still uh, less heard by our European partners. 
Well, at the same time, you know, really two points. First, if Trump is reelected in 2024, uh, you know, uh, the Europeans will be obliged again to face the prospect of the Americans leaving Europe, and that really may change their calculations. And also, uh, I think uh, what we could do also is have a coordination between European defense and, and NATO, because if the Americans want to really be less involved in Europe, uh, because of the Chinese priority, uh, then we need Europeans to be uh, more active, and which means more autonomous. Right, but are Europeans ready to be more active and more autonomous? I, you know, <laughs> uh, really, I more active. Uh, I, I suppose so because, uh, as I told you, uh, most of the countries, and especially Germany, have announced that they will increase their military budget. Uh, more autonomous. I will be on your side. No, they will. They don't want to be more autonomous. More than ever, uh, they want. Uh, they want to have the American leadership. You know, for most of the Europeans, but the French, uh, the American leadership is the premium of the insurance. There is an insurance they are really committed to, which is uh, uh, the U.S. military guarantee, and they accept the U.S. leadership as the premium of insurance. Now, um, uh, moving on to Germany uh, and looking at things from a broader perspective, why are Germany and France at odds with the Anglosphere over how to handle Russia? I mean, especially in the early days of the invasion, Germany, had, uh, Germany refused uh, to give overflight permits to British aircraft. It refused to sell weapons to Ukraine. How do you make sense of this? Well, first, I think, you know, uh, there is historical. Uh, you have had a, a long history of a relationship between Russia and Ukraine. You know, we uh, celebrate or commemorate, to, uh, I think, in 2022, the, the centennial of a treaty between uh, Germany and the Soviets in uh, just after the First World War. And it was against the Allies, by the way. And the, 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 the Germans uh, also have invested heavily in, uh, in Russia. They have a very important uh, uh, interest and they are depending on the Russian gas. You can say it's a mistake, but that's a fact. You know, foreign policy is handling the reality. So, so for the for the Germans, uh, really, uh, right now it's a difficult moment. They have to assess the situation. They have to change their policy. But I'm sure that they don't want to change it 100 percent. And I'm sure they consider they have to keep a, a, a channel uh, with Russia. Russia is there, and it will remain there, and uh, and there will be a, a, a post-war, post-Ukrainian war. I'm sure that this post-Ukrainian war, it won't be business as usual, uh, back to business as usual. I'm sure there will be a sort of a cold war, but nevertheless, uh, there will be a relationship with Russia. Right. Over the past years, we have seen... Uh... Uh, President Macron visited uh, Lebanon. He visited uh, a base in Iraq as well. We've seen uh, activity, of course, in Francophone Africa. Um, in your opinion, what kind of a role does France want to play in Europe and in the wider, uh, say, Middle East? You know, it's uh, foreign policy. Uh, uh, you know, it's defending your, your interests, defending your vision of the world. And I think what, is re re what the war in Ukraine has shown is that contrary to what we think, you know, the West is a sort of isolated. Uh, we have been the only ones, uh, the Western European countries, with our Western allies to implement sanctions against, against Russia. And a few, I think, two weeks ago, uh, the, the Russian Minister of Foreign Affairs, Lavrov, was greeted with smiles in New Delhi. Uh, and we know the, the strong relationship between China and, and Russia. So, is it possible, in a sense, to be a bridge uh, between the West and the rest of the world? Uh, I think it's critical that we don't create camps, you know, really a camp around the United States against the rest of the world, uh, that we try to, uh, to understand this new world, because there is a new world appearing in front of us. Uh, the West has dominated the world since the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. It's not anymore. It's not anymore the case. Uh, the G7 now is representing 40 percent or less than 40 percent of the GDP, the world GDP. It was 68 percent uh, 30 years ago. So uh, let's talk 
I think uh, the failure of the military interventions, you know, the American ones in Afghanistan and, and uh, Iraq, but also the problem of the French military intervention in North Africa show that the use of force is very rarely the solution. And, and Putin is proving it. We need diplomacy. We need to talk to everybody. And I, I hope that my country uh, will contribute to it. Right. Uh, when you mention Africa, do you see this escalating? Do you see the war in Ukraine uh, uh, and, uh, uh, as also casting a shadow over Africa, ramping up worries about Moscow's expanding influence in, uh, in the, on the continent, particularly uh, in countries that were former French colonies? Yes, uh, it, it has been a problem for some time. Uh, you know, in a sense, not because Russia, Russian influence is a problem in itself, you know, because considering the problems of these countries, which are among the poorest in the world, you know, uh, every contribution could be a positive one. But the problem of, of the Russians is that uh, their influence is, is managed through mercenaries. You know, they, they, they have mercenaries and these mercenaries are plundering uh, the national resource, the na natural resources of this country and are committed, committing gross violations of human rights. So that's the problem. And in a sense, uh, if, if we can reestablish a dialogue with Russia, uh, it will be great to convince the Russians to go back to a normal uh, political, economic, financial relationship with countries and not rely on, on mercenaries. But, you know, we discovered that the fact that Putin has been, was a former colonel of the KGB has consequences. You know, he's governing his country as a colonel of the KGB, and it's not the same. Right. Now, when you mentioned that uh, it's only Western countries that are implementing sanctions on Russia, Russia can still turn to, towards China for trade and, and energy. Uh, you can turn to India and African countries. But do you think the, all these economies put together can replace uh, the West European market? No, you know, that first, you know, when people say, oh, he could sell his oil or his gas to India or China, they don't understand that to, to, for doing it, uh, they should, it takes 10 years uh, for building pi the pipelines which are necessary. And, and also the markets, uh, if you want to enter the Indian market, you have to offer rebates. And what we understand of the oil sold to India is that it's really sold at a low price. And, and the West, even weakened, the weakened West actually uh, is also a source of precious uh, uh, technology. Uh, and of course, the European and uh, American markets are stable uh, and major markets. So uh, uh, anyway, the, the Russians, of course, could find a partial, uh, really, uh, compensation uh, in these countries, uh, but it will take years and it will be only partial. So you, do you think that in the short run, uh, Moscow will feel the heat of, the, of Western sanctions? You know, I, I just read, uh, I think it was in financial times, but that according to, uh, I think it maybe the OECD, I, I don't remember, saying that unfortunately the, the Ukrainian GDP could uh, collapse by 42% uh, uh, in this year, but that the Russian GDP will, uh, will uh, really go down by 15%. Losing 15% of your GDP is, is quite... Uh, uh, it's quite painful. Uh, but I'm not, you know, at the same time, uh, the re first Russia is a dictatorship, so the, the public opinion uh, doesn't have a say. And the fact is that uh, Russia, in a sense, is used to, it's a very strange way of saying, but it's used to suffer. You know, the Russians are also stoic uh, uh, because they went through a lot, a lot of ordeals uh, in, the last, uh, in the last century. And, and Putin is alone, in, uh, is alone and isolated in his own uh, uh, system. So I'm really, I'm not convinced that the sanctions will have an effect on the short-term decision, uh, decision-making process uh, in, the, in the Kremlin. Now, um, uh, one of the, as we move towards the end of our interview, um, uh, what do you make of the United Kingdom's actions in Ukraine? Um, do they show that the UK is still a key player uh, uh, in European security and hence perhaps even a crucial partner for, for France in the future? 
Of course, of course, UK is a, a crucial actor in, in, in the security matter. You know, in Europe, you have more or less two armies uh, which are able to, to intervene, to launch operations, and to cover a very wide range uh, uh, of, of uh, different operations, you know, UK and France. And we have been working together. Uh, we have been working closely together for, for decades. And there was a spe special, you know, really uh, treaty between UK, the UK and France in terms of security. So we have been totally, uh, I should say, really devastated, you know, really uh, by the decision of the UK to leave the European Union, which is weakening our, our union. And, and we, the French, we are trying to keep our cooperation with the UK. It's, it's really, it is very, very, very important that that we succeed to do it. It's not very easy because Brexit has political consequences. It's a bit toxic in terms of atmospherics. Uh, but uh, I think we are we are committed uh, right. to but, keep this but security. Wouldn't relationship. you agree that that UK's actions in Ukraine have been very proactive uh, in a way, militaristic? They they took very they really went to great lengths to arm the Ukrainians with very sophisticated. Uh, NATO grade weapons. I think you know really very often you discover that uh, in foreign policy, uh, you know, sort of uh, several countries are acting uh, in what you consider different ways, but uh, actually you're looking at the landscape. It's complementary. I think it's good that the UK is providing this type of weapons because if we want to have peace, if we want to have a peace agreement, uh, we have. Uh, to give weapons to the Ukrainians so they are able to resist to the Russians. You know, usually when you're in a war, you have a peace when either there is a winner or a loser, and we are not in this type of situation because obviously the Ukrainians are not the losers, and, or uh, the two sides reach the point where they decide that actually it's not worth continuing the fight. And, mm -hmm. and I, th I think it's what we are trying to, to, to do, to convince Putin that, because he's the only one able to take this decision, because Zelensky has already said he's ready to negotiate, he's ready to compromise and concessions. Uh, so we have to convince Putin that it's totally useless to continue the fighting. It's costly to him, and you have seen yesterday that he has lost the flagship of, of uh, the Black Sea uh, and, uh, Navy, of his Black Sea Navy. Uh, and 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 so so we have to support uh, uh, Putin. So on one side, the, the, the British are giving weapons to the Ukrainians. And I think on the other side, you have also uh, the French, the Turks, uh, the Israelis, uh, who are trying to keep open, as I've said, a, a channel with Putin. Right. And finally, do you see the, the war in Ukraine as possibly precipitating into, into um, a wider European conflict? Or do you think President Putin will want to keep it as a frozen conflict compared to uh, uh, Abkhazia, South Ossetia, or perhaps even Nagorno-Karabakh? You know, I have to, uh, my question I, I'm going to answer in two stages. The first stage was that if, you had, uh, if we had this interview, you know, the 20th of February, and if you had asked me whether Putin was going to invade Ukraine, I would have answered no, of course, no, you know, really. So I think it's a way of qualifying what I'm going to say. Uh, no, I don't think that there will be, that Russia will be full enough, you know, to try to widen the conflict, because there is a certainty is that uh, the, the NATO members will fulfill their obligation. And if there is uh, an attack against Estonia or Latvia, we will come to the rescue and to the defense of Latvia and Estonia, and it would become very, very, very difficult. Uh, that's the really. And second, uh, and uh, you know, to conclude, I think you, you make you made a good point. I think it will be it's very difficult to think about a peace agreement between Ukraine and Russia right now. Uh, because, you know, even if the Ukrainians are ready to make concessions on neutralization, the Ukrainians are not going to give up on the Donbass and on the Crimea. And on the re Russian side, there is no agreement without, without that. So I think that the most likely scenario, unfortunately, would be a, a Korean, uh, Korean uh, 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 scenario, you know, with a ceasefire, a line of ceasefire and two enemies. Uh, on, the, for, on each side of, uh, of the line of, of ceasefire, which means that we could have 
a, a, another frozen conflict on our continent. Right. Ambassador Gerard, it was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you.